Hi, beautiful people. Welcome to the Fort Salem Library, where we read you your fanfiction. So sit down or don't, relax or don't, and enjoy these stories in a way you have not before. We at Fort Salem Library do not own Motherland Fort Salem or any of the related characters. The Motherland Fort Salem series is created by Elliot Lawrence and owned by Freeform. This story is a work of fan fiction and is meant for entertainment only. We are not making any profit from these stories. All rights of the original Motherland Fort Salem story belong to Freeform. We also do not own Her Song is a Sin or any of its original characters and storylines. We did, however, get permission from the author to read their story. This story was created and written by Lou One, and you can find the link in our show notes. This story is being read to you by me, Brit. Her Song is a Sin Chapter 27 You're heading out in this? George eyed Isadora through the snow that had started to fall. There were weather alerts sounding periodically, interrupting his TV show. Yes, I'm going to try and make it home to see my family. You're starting to complain that they don't remember what I look like. Isadora had a suite in the mansion, and normally would stay over. However, with Scylla safe in West Virginia came a cleared schedule. Isadora had caught up on her work and had planned to spend some much-needed time with her family. George couldn't help but return a smile that was so rare on the manager's face. Well, you'd better be careful, miss. They're saying we're likely to get some snow squalls. Isadora shivered as the cold crept into her car and the heat had difficulty compensating. Crazy to have snow like this so early in the season. What about you? Aren't you supposed to be off duty by now? Katie's babysitter fell through, so she had to run her son over to her mom's before she could get here. I'm just holding down the fort until she arrives. Isadora's brows rose, and she wondered if maybe she'd misjudged the guard. It was a kind gesture. What is good of you, George? The guard shrugged. Just do my part, ma'am. You drive safely now. Isadora shuddered again as another cold blast whipped through her car window and gave the guard a smile. Thank you. Goodbye, George. As soon as the taillights from Isadora's car disappeared in the snow, the smile on George's face fell. That cunt had better hurry up, he thought. He'd only agreed to wait for Katie because he was still waiting on Helen to make good on their deal. It struck him odd that the groundskeeper hadn't even contacted him over the radio with an update. In fact, there had been no movement at the gates, so the mechanic must still be there. He didn't have a clue what the fuck they were doing out there, and to be honest, he didn't really care. He already called and promised his girl a good time, and now he didn't have to party favors to make good on his promise. A car pulled up to the gate, and he scowled at the red-faced woman behind the wheel. About damn time. Sorry, George, Katie said, her cheeks flushed. I'll park the car and pee, and I'll be right back as soon as I can. Didn't you pee before you left? George said, annoyed that he'd have to wait even longer. I couldn't get Chase to get his things together. It took me a while. You know how he is when there's a change in plans. George understood that Katie's son had autism, and a long list of other demands of his mother, so he shook his head. An idea came to him, though, and before he opened the gate for her to pass, he said, Look, if you gotta go in the shed to pee, why don't you grab me a little something from Helen's emergency stash? Katie's eyes widened, and she shook her head. I don't like going through Helen's stuff, George. You do it before you leave. Look, Katie, you owe me. It won't take but a minute, and you're already going in there. I promised my girl a good time, but Helen's been busy. Busy doing what? Katie asked. Never mind what, George said. I'm not saying rob her, just get to her stash and take like three nuggets from the jar. Here, I even have a bag. Katie sighed but finally nodded her head. Okay, George, I'll be back in a bit. By the time she made it back outside with the drugs, George was already walking down the drive and met her halfway. She handed him the bag and he put it in his jacket. What about the change overlogs? George shook his head. Nothing to report, and there's not going to be anything with the storm. It's dead out here. Katie frowned but nodded. She was shivering in the cold because in her haste to get Chase to her mom's after his meltdown, 
She'd forgotten to get her heavier coat. The bodyguard who had taken over security from Helen had insisted that the guards meet in the shack to go over the day's visitor's log and discuss everything of interest. But George was probably right. Okay, George. Have a good time with your girlfriend. And be careful. George barely offered her a nod as he hurried towards his parked car. Less than five minutes later, Kenny looked up from the empty visitor log and offered George a wave as he sped past the shag in his jeep. The groundskeeper tested her restraints on her wrist with little movement. As soon as she was sure the mechanic was gone, Helen tried to break free from her binds. She struggled for what seemed like forever before her head dropped in exhaustion. When her eyes opened again, she didn't know how much time had passed. All she knew was that she was thirsty, tired, and very weak. The pain she'd felt earlier had strangely subsided. Helen guessed that her body was in shock. What had been just splatters of red earlier had become the predominant shade on her shirt. She made a couple more feeble attempts at her restraints, which stopped when she heard the latch on the trap door again. Well, Miss Graves... Oh, look at you, Theo said in a sarcastic, upbeat tone as he made his way down into the room. You moved the chair further than I would have guessed. Just a little fighter, aren't you? The mechanic walked over to the camera and made some adjustments, tilting the camera a little lower. Helen heard the sound of her cell phone chirp and knew that the tone signaled a text from Scylla. As she watched, Theo removed the phone from a pocket in his overalls and read the message. After a moment, he put it back in his pocket and picked up a rag from the workbench. Opening a bottle of water, he poured some of it on the cloth. Hearing Helen whimper, he turned to the bleeding and bound gardener with a smile. Well, okay, new plan, the mechanic said softly to himself. Miss Graves, have you ever had a moment in your life where you were compelled to say amen? Theo asked. The gardener looked down at her raw, reddened wrists and then up at the mechanic. At the moment, nothing comes to mind. Well, you have to have faith, Helen. He raised his voice enough to make her sit up. Sorry, uh, just excited when talking about faith, you know. Um, the mechanic remembered his audience and shook his head. Yeah, maybe not. Theo walked towards the gardener, the wet cloth in one hand and a bottle of water in the other. As she watched him approach, her body stiffened, every instinct on high alert and telling her to run or to fight. The mechanic stopped in front of her chair and asked, Pardon my manners. May I call you Helen? He reached forward with the cloth, gingerly wiping blood and dirt off of the gardener's face. Theo started to comfort her as he wiped the blood. Shh, 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 there we go. Much better. Helen glared at him in pain. Why was he doing this? The groundskeeper looked up from the chair and met the mechanic's gaze and then back at the water bottle. She gulped, trying to swallow, and pain seared her throat. Surprisingly, the mechanic opened the bottle and tipped the water towards her mouth. Greedily, she drank the offered liquid. Very little water dribbled from the sides of her mouth as she quenched her thirst. For Helen, someone who prided herself on reading people, she was angry at herself. Theo's personality was everywhere. The groundskeeper couldn't help, thinking she could have stopped him. As soon as Helen finished one thought, the mechanic's entire demeanor had changed again. The change of personalities continued to baffle her. This last round, she heard him for a couple of minutes. He sounded mad, and Theo's voice was rigid, like how an old man would sound. Vaguely, he sounded like his dad, though she was just a kid when she last heard his voice. However, the cadence was there. Now the mechanic sounded chipper, even friendly. His actions seemed almost kind. And a part of her wondered if she could escape somehow, take advantage of his twisted kindness. She tried to think, but her mind was a blur. Helen heard Theo still talking, his voice sounding like it was getting farther and farther ahead. She could only make out bits and pieces. The groundskeeper started to feel lightheaded, and out of instinct she closed her eyes and shook her head, trying to focus. Don't slip, Helen. Keep at it. Figure this bastard out. She kept having to remind herself. The maniac made it clear he wanted Syl. 
Faith, Helen. You must have faith. After all, look at what faith has brought me. The Lord gave me you. He put the abomination that you are right in my path. And I will use you to get to your precious witch. It is a miracle. Helen's eyes opened, surprised to see that Theo had moved back across the tiny space to the workbench. He had traded the empty water bottle and the cloth for his knife. The blood-stained blade glinted in his hand as he flashed it before him, holding it as comfortably as a conductor would be in front of his orchestra. Theo started to lead a sixth symphony only he could hear. Oh, I don't suppose you can really appreciate the miracle if you're restrained like that. Theo made a sort of bound from across the room towards Helen's chair. He stood there, blade hanging in the air between them. He waited until at last Helen's eyes closed again, her head drooping, and with the knife, he cut the duct tape that was securing the gardener's wrist to the chair. There was discomfort on the groundkeeper's back, as if there was a dull rake going up her back slowly, over and over. The sensation of being pulled by her legs brought Helen back to consciousness. She felt so groggy. Her brain felt like it had cotton in it. Drugged, she realized. The water must have had something in it. She'd been foolish enough to think that the bastard was being kind, showing a sign of weakness. She thought she'd be able to take advantage of the situation, but he had been one step ahead. She struggled to lift her head and look at her surroundings. The ground was cold. The nor'easter she had heard about on the weather channel earlier must have already moved into the area, dumping snow on the grounds. On the bright side, the cold seemed to help her clear her head a bit, and she was able to see where the mechanic had left her on the ground. She raised her head, and her eyes widened at the sight. There, hanging from the tree, was a swing that was just swaying in the wind. Two long robes had been fastened to the branch and a flat wooden seat had been attached. The sight was shocking. Helen's mind flashed back to a time from long ago when they were teenagers. She half wondered if she was hallucinating, but then she saw Theo's form. He was adjusting the game camera that she had mounted to the tree. Whatever he had planned, she knew she only had minutes while he was distracted to move. Slowly, she shifted her body and scanned the snow-blanketed ground for something she could use as a weapon. As her hands moved through the snow, her fingers closed around a large rock. The rock would have to do, and she knew she needed to make it count. The crunching of the snow under the mechanic's feet sounded amplified. He was humming the tune to Sexy Back. It was that tune that started to help her focus. Whatever mix of drugs the psycho had given her was strong. Still on all fours, she looked in the direction the music coming from. Seeing Theo and the swing, her focus slipped. Her mind showed her an illusion. Clay? She muttered, but remembered. It's the psycho trying to kill you. Trying to kill Scylla. Overconfident, Theo walked back from the tree and kneeled down to be eye to eye with the gardener. No. I wish I could say you'll see him in heaven, but your soul has been marked for eternal punishment for what you did to him. A fire ignited inside Helen. The gardener gripped the rock as tight as she could. I'll see you there. Her eyes widened and face tensed. Theo saw the change, but his overconfidence made him hesitate. In that split second, the groundskeeper swung her arm with rock in hand meeting Theo's forehead. He fell back from the hit, knocking him off balance. At that moment, Helen could only yell at herself, Stand up now! One foot planted, she shifted her weight. The mechanic, still woozy, tried to grab at her again. Fuck you! Helen shouted, moving the rock to her other hand as she swung it towards the mechanic. This time, it connected to the other side of Theo's jaw. Her fear, her pain, her trauma... All seemed to collect in the pit of her stomach. She felt anger, love for Scylla, even love for Byron and Porter. They were a fucked up group, but they were family, and this bastard was trying to destroy that family, the only family that she had. The mechanic, usually not phased, was shocked by the first hit, and then the second. 
A taste of copper formed in his mouth and he felt a liquid warmth on his skin. A thin red line had left a trail from the first hit that landed. He touched it and was rewarded with a sharp sting and the warm liquid substance coated his fingers. With a quick glance down, he confirmed it was blood. The bitch had dared to strike at God's soldier. Aw, little Maxi Pad has a boo-boo, Helen said. If she didn't know anything, she knew psychological warfare. She'd spent her life reading people, just like she had seen Clay. She saw the fucked-up daddy's boy that stood in front of her now. Just have to keep distracted long enough to get a weapon. His weapon, Helen thought. The groundskeeper no longer had the rock in hand. It slipped to the ground with the last strike. Oh my god, that's so original. Are we five now? Theo said, still spitting the blood out of his mouth. No, we aren't, but you are still a little bitch, Maxipad, Helen said, as she raised her right arm across her body and backhanded him. The hit from the gardener struck the soldier down. That nickname started from Clay. Feelings came flooding back and overwhelmed him. He could hear it in his head. Clay's teenage voice singing the nickname in his head. He felt tears spring to his eyes. His brother, he died right here, in this damp place. This wicked ground. He had sinned. Had he sought forgiveness... Or had the witch tainted him before he died? Marked him for hell, too. You heathen child. Snap out of it. Stay on mission. From the depths of his mind, he felt something take over. He spoke in a voice that froze Helen in her tracks. Through you, we will push back our adversaries. Riel narrowed her eyes, trying to focus on the road and looked out the windshield through the blinding white snow that seemed to come right at her. Her hands tightened on the steering wheel as she drove the SUV, keeping pace with the tactical team as they headed towards the mansion. Inside the vehicle, it was deadly silent. Everyone inside was scared of the unknown that awaited them. It was taking too damn long to get to the house. The snow was slowing them down more than expected. It gave everyone too much idle time to think. Riel knew that that was dangerous, that it led to overthinking and would allow negative thoughts to creep in everyone's head, especially when what was needed was for everyone to focus on the mission. Riel risked taking her eyes off of the road for a second and gave Scylla a sideways glance in the passenger seat. Her heart ached for the brunette who was gripping her phone so tightly in her lap that her knuckles were white. The phone mocked her, staying silent. There had been no return call or text from Helen. The bodyguard had to break the silence, not just for the musician, but for everyone. Sill, breathe. We are not giving up. We're almost there. Between them, the radio crackled to life and everyone in the SUV jumped at the sound of Tally's voice. Scylla gripped Rael's arm, making the vehicle slide on the road. Rael cursed as she righted it. Watch it! Byron hissed from the back seat. The bodyguard put her hands on Scylla's leg. With a rub and a pat, she mouthed, We're okay. Porter put his hands on Byron's knee and squeezed it. Ray's got this, he whispered to the artist. At least I hope she does, Porter thought, his eyes watching the bodyguard as she lifted the radio to her mouth and talked to her friend. No, nothing yet, Rael said in response to the question about Helen making contact after Scylla's earlier calls. There was some more chatter back and forth, and finally Alder gave her permission for Scylla to try to make contact again via text once they were at the mansion. Copy that. I'll relay the message, Rael said, ending the conversation and putting the radio's receiver back down. The bodyguard glanced at the musician and knew there was no need to say anything. Scylla had been listening to the exchange and had nodded her understanding. She looked down at her phone, noticing the signal going in and out from the storm. She hoped beyond hope that the storm was the only thing that was keeping Helen from returning her call. At the pond, the groundskeeper, fueled by rage, stood before Theodore. The loss of blood made her body lethargic, which caused a hitch in her step. The crazed man noticed the hesitation. Before Helen could react, she saw the mechanic lunge toward her. His arms reached out for her and around her body holding her. 
it felt like a strange embrace, until she felt the sharpest pain radiating from her stomach. Helen was frozen in place from shock and pain as Theo pulled her close and whispered in her ear, This is for my brother. A knife in your stomach. The perfect revenge for how you stabbed him in the back by betraying your duty as a human to help him when he needed you. Theo spun her around, forcing her back against a tree, and stabbed the groundskeeper again. That's why you were chosen today. Your actions caused God to smite you, and it is my mission to carry out his punishment. As the gardener started to fall forward, he caught her and carried her to the swing. Theo continued to speak as he worked at tying her in place on the swing. He didn't really care if the groundskeepers heard what he was saying, because he knew that God would hear his promise and his father would hear it. I will kill Scylla next. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. You are the reason she will come to me. This is how I was meant to set you free. As he finished his work with Helen and moved to his bag by the tree to prepare for the witch's arrival, he hummed sexy back. The vehicles finally reached the mansion, and Rael watched the SUV that Tally drove pull towards the front gates. Another vehicle with tactical personnel followed close behind them. It went against Rael's instincts to not follow them, too. Not to be part of the frontal assault, but she had her orders. More importantly, she had the people in the vehicle to think about. She looked over at Scylla again as they continued on the main road, where they would make their way around to the back entrance of the property. Okay, we have to go ahead to text Helen. Remember the story. It's just you heading back, and you two need to talk. Right, Scylla said and unlocked her phone. Riel watched how Scylla's fingers shook as she sought to press the right letters to make her sentence. After what seemed like forever, a noise from her phone confirmed that her message went through. The blonde frowned as she turned her focus back to the road and looked for the gap in the trees where the back road would be. The snow was making everything more difficult, and it could complicate what should have been a fairly simple mission. As hard and fast as the snow fell, Riel knew they must be in some sort of snow squall. It was a freak storm for this time of year, and the blonde couldn't help but question Alder's decision to strike tonight of all nights. They could have maintained the element of surprise at least until the next morning, and by then hopefully the storm would have been over. There, Byron announced from the back seat. But it was too late, and the SUV sped past the road even as the bodyguard started pumping the brakes. Cursing, Riel made a U-turn and looked for the roads she just missed. She frowned as she finally found the gap and turned the SUV onto the side road. Even though the snow was heavy, she couldn't help but notice there was areas where the snow looked more compacted than others. The bodyguard stopped in front of the gate and hopped out to use the keypad to open it. Inside the car, Byron pulled out his phone and frowned as he watched his signal come and go. Hey, Syl, you got a signal? In the front seat, Scylla shook her head. No. Must be this crazy storm, Porter said. The musician heard her friend's comment, but her eyes were following Rael's form as the blonde opened the gate. With the snow falling heavier and heavier as the minutes ticked by and the wind howling, Scylla was surprised to see Rael walking around the gate rather than immediately making her way back to the car. Scylla's brows furrowed. The impatient musician just put her hands on the door handle when the blonde finally turned back to the car. The door opened, and with a chilly, wet blast of snow, Riel got back behind the wheel. What is it? the musician asked. Riel shook her head, even as she rubbed her hands together, trying to warm them. I don't know. Something just doesn't feel right. Sylla looked back down at her phone and watched as the signal continued to fluctuate from one bar to two, then back to no bars at all. The Wi-Fi wasn't much better, even though there were extenders all over the property. Riel watched her and asked what she already guessed. Still no response from Helen? No, Scylla answered. The signal keeps dropping. Well, let's drive onto the property. Maybe you'll get better luck with the Wi-Fi. Riel stared down the gravel and dirt road and continued driving the SUV even as the road ended. They were close to the clearing where the blonde had set up her shooting range. She stopped the vehicle when her headlights flashed on the metal of another car parked several feet away. What the hell? Porter said, more to himself than the others. 
I don't recognize it. Nor do I, Scylla said, looking over at Rael. The blonde's mouth was set in a grim line, and she shook her head. I think I do. You do? I think that's the car that was following us. There was a car following us? When? The day after the restaurant, remember? I had the trees cut after? Scylla's eyes widened with the memory. That's right. You jumped out of the car once we got on the property. The musician frowned as more memories of that day returned to her. I asked Helen about it. She said you thought it might be the guy stalking me. Helen was with us, Riel. Riel frowned and shook her head. I know, Syl. So it can't be Helen, Scylla said, her excited voice filling the tiny space in the car. The blonde shook her head. I don't know. All the blonde knew for certain was that there was a car where it shouldn't be, a car that looked a lot like the one she chased that day. I'm going to check it out. She looked at Scylla and then glanced back towards the wide eyes watching her from the back seat. Stay here. After she'd received nods from everyone, Riel suggested that Scylla keep trying to reach Helen and hopped out of the car. Her feet sunk into the snow and she trudged towards the parked car. Even with the snow partially covering the vehicle, she recognized it as the white Toyota Camry that had been following the limo that day. What the hell was it doing here? And how had it got past the gate? Tally offered the petite blonde in the guard shack a small smile, along with her ID as she stopped at the gate. After she'd explained why she and the others in the SUV were there, Alder began barking questions from the passenger seat. No, there had not been any visitors according to the log, the only person to leave the grounds was Isadora. When the questions turned to Helen and her whereabouts, Tally couldn't help but notice that Katie became visibly more nervous. Do you know where Miss Graves is on the grounds? The blonde shook her head and Tally frowned. Not wanting to upset the friendly agent, Katie picked up her radio receiver. I can try to contact her. No, Alder shouted from the passenger side. Katie immediately dropped the radio back down on the small desk, and even Tally jumped at Alder's order. Just do as the officer who joins you says, and try to stay out of the way, okay? Katie nodded as Alder spoke into her radio. A moment later, a young man in tactical gear got out of the second SUV and made his way towards the guard shack. If this was about Helen's drugs, they were going to an awfully big fuss to bring her in, Katie thought as she made room for the man and his gear. She pressed herself against the far wall of the guard shack. The officer, with his gear and gun in hand, took up quite a bit of the already small space. The image that popped in her mind was that of a can of sardines. She offered him a small smile and wondered if he felt as awkward as she did. Gate, he asked without further introductions, and Katie reached for the button. A moment later the gate opened, and the agents made their way onto the property. What is she doing? Scylla asked. From the way that Rael had parked the SUV, she couldn't see what the bodyguard was up to in the dark. Byron tried to twist around, but couldn't see much through the snow. I can't tell. Porter? The blonde attempted to look out the window, but could only see snow where the light from Rael's phone glowed. The heat from the car combined with the moisture was also starting to fog up the windows. He shook his head. It's snowing too much to really see anything. I wish she would hurry up. Byron said a moment later. There was an audible hitch to his voice, and Porter reached for his boyfriend's hand in the dark. She knows what she's doing. Byron swallowed hard. Let's hope so. A moment later, a chime broke the uneasy silence in the car. It was followed by several more chirps and chimes as the Wi-Fi finally connected and their phones lit up with notifications. There, among the various alerts, Scylla whooped with joy as she saw a message from Helen. The happiness only lasted for a split second, though, as to read the confusing and cryptic message. Great. When you get here, come out by the old pond. Found something really important I need to show you. Your eyes only. Scylla didn't take time to think. She just hopped out of the car. Syl! Byron shouted from the back seat. Where are you going? I'm gonna go check something out. I'll be right back. Byron started to protest, but Scylla had already shut the door and was quickly swallowed up by the darkness and the blowing snow. What the hell? Byron grumbled. Porter didn't know what to do. Part of him wanted to stay with Byron, the other part wanted to go after his friend. Byron looked at him expectantly. 
Well, go on. You'll be okay? I'm sure as hell not leaving this spot. Okay, Porter said as he hopped out of the back seat and into the cold. They breached the maintenance building quietly and made their way up to the stairs to Helen's apartment. No sound came from beyond the door, and after a moment, the tactical team granted him access. The agents swarmed into the small space, and after a moment, it was pronounced clear. Moments later, Team 2 cleared the mansion. As the third team cleared the garage, and the secondary team moved to the next set of buildings on the property, Alder stood in the center of Helen's apartment with her hands on her hips and frowned. What are we missing here? Telly shook her head as she looked up from her search of the apartment. Well, people don't just disappear like a fart in the wind, Alder said, quoting a line from one of her favorite movies. Around her, the other agents from the first team buzzed about executing the search of the apartment as per the warrant allowed. No, Telly agreed, as she broke away from the bookshelf she'd been expecting and joined her partner. She seriously doubted the property had sewer lines for Helen to hide in and crawl out of like Andy and Shawshank. Though, maybe Riel would know something that they didn't. Some place that Gardner could hide. She reached for her phone, clipped to her belt, when one of the agents called out. Agent Alder, you'd better come see this. Alder and Telly walked over to the agent sitting at a small desk in the corner of the living room. He'd opened a laptop and there was an image on the screen. The screen glowed green as the night vision features of a camera revealed their suspect sitting on a swing, swaying in the wind, eyes closed, and her head resting on her shoulder. Please find a fan fiction you just listened to on Archive of Our Own and leave the author some love. Without them, this wouldn't be possible, and we want to thank them from the bottoms of our hearts for creating these amazing stories and keeping the show alive.